from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. We're very pleased to bring you a program on a subject that we have covered over the last three years on a couple of occasions. Our guest is Frank Henderson, who is a volunteer executive uh, for the International Executive Service Corps, which is located in Stanford, Connecticut. Our guest, uh, who has been with us before, has discussed what's going on in Eastern Europe and, th and throughout Russia in the Siberia area. He has made uh, a number of visits uh, as a specialist on behalf of this organization to help with the new development. As you know, uh, Eastern Europe, after the fall of communism, is looking at experimentation with uh, new systems and organization and looking at democracy. Today we want to particularly address what is the proper role of government in business development. Our guest in a very short time is going to be returning to Europe to go to the Ukraine uh, to yet again contribute to the development of that part of the world. Frank, we've had you here before and it's always been a pleasure having you here and you're most informed and thank you for taking time to be with us today and to discuss again this important issue. Well, thank you. I'm always pleased to be here to share the uh, experiences that I've had in Eastern Europe. And it seems each country has a different set of problems. And in the Ukraine, they are unique because their technology is so advanced, they occupy a different position economically. So it'll be somewhat different than the other trips you've taken, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, I want to also welcome uh, Janelle Burke, who's a regular panelist and is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And to pursue what uh, Frank has just uh, started talking about, we will invite Janelle to ask the first series of questions. Uh, Mr. Henderson, for the benefit of our viewers, would you tell us where exactly is the Ukraine? The country of Ukraine is immediately east of uh, Poland. It shares a border with Poland, shares a border with Romania, and is uh, on a, a little part of their border is shared with the country of Hungary. What language do they speak there? Is there a, a well, they speak two languages. Language? Pardon me. They speak two languages. In the eastern part of the Ukraine, near the Russian border, they speak Russian. In the western part of the Ukraine, near Poland, they speak Ukrainian, which is slightly different. Now, they have a government in place at this time. What, what is the form of their government, if you will? The form of their government is uh, almost identical to what uh, Russia has. There is a president and there is a parliament. In Russia, it's called the Duma. In Ukraine, it has another name, which I don't know. Then the entire country is divided into what we would call states, and they call oblasts. Significant difference with us, however, is that their oblast does not ha have an independent constitution. They simply follow a national law, whereas we have state constitutions and we can have differing policies for taxation and so forth. Now you're going to be going there and you, you have a plan as to how you're going to approach the problem. And you explained to us before the, the show started how this works. Can you, uh, for the benefit of our viewers, share that with them? So I was able to go to the Ukraine about two months ago to visit with the high officials, the vice governors of the, this oblast, and ask them exactly what they wanted to know. And they said specifically they wanted to learn what is the proper role of government in business development. Their economy is really in very terrible condition. Their, their technology is high, their potential is high. They could enter world markets with the technical advances they have but they don't know how to do it. And they have questioned whether or not government should be the agency that takes the leadership role in developing business within their country. So we're going there to discuss that question. Now you'll start and, and then you will make some recommendations to them after you've had a chance to talk with a number of people, I take it. And you also do a very uh, intensive five-day workshop, is that correct? That's right. There are four of us that go there as volunteers, and we constitute a team. My role will be uh, to discuss the specific government functions that we present the U.S. model. So I will be discussing the role that government takes here in business development. And uh, uh, one of the people will discuss specifically uh, what they need to do to attract foreign investment, how to make themselves attractive. And the third and fourth members of the team assist the two of us in our workshops. 
Frank, when we had on the program before, you've talked in the, in the same way about other countries. Can you take a few minutes? Let, let me back up to say that uh, obviously with the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the, that very large country and the different republics broke into separate countries like the Republic of Russia became a country now here's Ukraine. Uh, in following up on Janelle's questions, uh, what makes the Ukraine very different from some of the other Eastern European countries that you have visited and also within Russia itself where you have been? Well, there are several factors. Uh, one of them social, one of them's uh, economic, another other was political. Uh, but if I could sort out the ones that we're going to deal with, I want to, they're tech, I've mentioned technology. They are really advanced. And in, when the you know, Soviet Union was all together, the Soviets seemed to focus their technology centers in specific areas, kept them tightly located, physically together. And the Ukraine has the city where I will be. They are a center for the manufacture of uh, satellites for communication. They manufacture rockets and rocket fuels. They do marvelous things in medical technology. And, and it is their nuclear research center. And it's only not too many miles from Chernobyl, about 125 miles. And so all this technology is focused right there. But their economy is stagnant. And so they need to do something about it. We hear so many reports about the problems in what is now Russia and, and, and also with the illness of the president, uh, uh, Mr. Yeltsin, that that may be hindering even addressing some of the problems. Without that same kind of leadership problem of health matters in the Ukraine, is there a better chance that they can address what you're going over to talk about than, or are they in better or worse shape than Russia? I think they're in a better position. I, I, you know, they're strong with their educational background. They're strong with their potential in industry. And I think they're especially strong because of who is their president. It's a person whose last name is Kuchma, President Kuchma. He was the CEO of the largest industrial complex in this technical center. And he, the, his company had 57,000 employees. That's how huge it is. And so he is a businessman to start with. He's a financial man. He probably has things to learn from a marketing standpoint, but at least he understands what needs to be done to do business. And he is, has a, uh, developed a rep reputation of being very progressive. And what I've seen him propose in a way of amending tax laws and so forth indicates he is on the right track. So that's a, that's a sign that, that your representatives and the organization you represent can have more, maybe more success there than in some countries. Uh, but one thing I was wondering about is that because Ukraine and Russia and that whole system were under the control of government for so long and the whole economy was uh, state-owned, is there a struggle to understand uh, the change to where the private uh, sector can be very effective in building the country? Well, there's, uh, there's certainly a struggle and there's a reluctance to admit that government has, has a role. Uh, but I, one of the problems is that while they have this progressive president, they have uh, a legislature uh, that is still locked up in the old socialist thinking. It's a mindset they can't seem to get behind them. And so while the president is very progressive and has the right ideas, he has to have them go be approved by the legislature and they are very reluctant to do that. But slowly, one by one, and very gradually, they are making progress. Now in your work uh, with others that represent this organization, do you have opportunities to meet with uh, some of those legislators to try to move them uh, in their thinking uh, to some of these uh, ideas? They, they may, some of those may attend. For the most part, the people who will attend will be officials from the oblast, from what we would call the state government, and then also from the city government, from the city administration. And they'll all be involved one way or another with economics, uh, planning, business development, and the overall administration of the, of the economy. Another question I have, you, you trigger so many questions for me, uh, my thinking, is that as you look at different pockets of the economy in Ukraine, I would as assume that some of those are already, as you've indicated, are prospering. And if they do real well using the theories of the new president, uh, that that may encourage the legislative body to say, this is the way to go. Absolutely. And we try to focus on what we think could provide uh, an example that would provide them the most immediate example of success. Because we think that once they see how free enterprise works, 
how they can change a defense industry to a consumer product and successfully sell that product, then it will expand and, and it will flourish. One other question before I go back to our panel member. Is part of your plan and ideas that you recommend that some of those that maybe are most uh, difficult to convince that the change is necessary uh, would be invited to come to the United States or Great Britain or somewhere and to see for themselves the effects of a different kind of system? Uh, yes, indeed. That's in every country I've been there has been an exchange program um, that is usually implemented. It's paid by the U.S. Information Agency and they will provide internships for industry leaders to come to the United States for a month, for two months, for three months, and to be actively inserted into the dynamics of our ways of doing business, and it's really helpful. Thank you, Janelle. Well, we've talked a little bit about business and economics, but very much tied to business and economics is also the social programs of a country. And can you tell us a little bit what about the quality of life in these countries, um, and include now not just the Ukraine, but the other countries that you visited in um, Eastern Europe. Can you tell us about the quality of life? What is life like there for the average person? Well, by our standards, it's, it is very difficult. I think by their standards, and they have lived under deprived conditions for a long time, that they are not as unhappy as I personally think they should be. <laughs> But they have, uh, they place a high value on family. There is a resurgence of, uh, of people going back to church now that they can freely go to church. In the Ukraine, the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church is the dominant one. In Russia, it was the Russian Orthodox Church. But here and there, I see um, missionaries from the United States bringing um, the Protestant uh, viewpoints there, and all of them seem to be popular. So family quality of life is Typically, both husband and wife work if they can f both find jobs. They have to economically. But they take great thrills in their academic, uh, the ad academic achievement of their children. Music and art, is, they have values there that we envy. Now, in terms of family life, uh, what is the condition of the woman's role uh, like in these countries? It is, she works all day. If she has a job, she works at the job. When, when she comes home and she's a mother, she takes care of the kids and does the clothes. And we see them at all hours of the day hanging clothes outside on a line to dry. We see uh, they don't have vacuum cleaners. We saw them taking carpets out of their apartments. And they, they have a structure outside the apartment buildings where they can hang the carpets. And when I was a child 50 years ago, they had this carpet beater. They still use carpet beaters to clean their carpets. So their life is difficult. Now, I don't know, they, but personally, they seem to be happy, they smile, they laugh. Are they using um, a lot of what we would call uh, appliances in their uh, apartments? Uh, for example, toasters, uh, can openers, uh, stoves, all of these kinds of things. They have an electric stove and they have a refrigerator, and for the most part, that's the total of what they have. We had an interesting experience in Russia. It was my wife and I have toast for breakfast, and we found in a store a, a new toaster, and we bought it. The girls in the office were amazed that we thought that was so important, but we let them use it in the office for a while, and they went out and bought their own toaster. So you see, they haven't been exposed to these conveniences. Um, and as they are, and as they can afford it, they will adopt them. But, uh, other than that, they don't have things like a disposal unit in your sink. Okay. Dishwashers? Um, very makeshift dishwashers. No, oh, dishwashers. Oh, no. Uh, clothes washers are very antiquated, very old. And not dryers, I would take it. No. Uh, everything that is self-dried. That would be rare. They, they do have dryers there, which they could buy, but they're so expensive and the economy is so difficult that very few people have them. Is there such a thing as divorce in the families? Yes, I don't, uh, and I think it's, from what I've heard, it's not uncommon. But I don't know what, a, what percentage that would be. Do people have large families, or are the number of children usually limited due to the economic circumstances I, in which they live? Two seems to be the maximum. I, I don't know as we've ever met a family that had more than two. And it seems very common that the children live at home until they become married, and then they move out. 
Frank, as we look at the Ukraine where you're headed on, on this next trip uh, to assist, uh, you've indicated that it's been built into the thinking processes, into the structure about how are they going to develop politically, economically, and socially. But if they get through some of those difficulties and see that, that, that another system is most workable, what are the chances that they have the proper natural resources? In other words, even if the theory is accepted, is the potential great? Is, is the wealth of the country sufficient to create that kind of change? In the Ukraine, they do not have all of the natural resources they need. For energy, uh, oil, and gas, they're almost totally dependent upon the Soviet Union. Not totally, but probably 90 percent of, of that energy comes from Russia. Um, they seem to depend less and less on nuclear generated electricity. They have not built modern plants and there's a discouragement with their history in that field. And so they will, they have some minerals. I th believe they have iron. They have a lot of coal, but they, the minerals that are used in uh, electronics, uh, gold and silver and some of those other metals like chromium and nickel, they don't have that. So they are, they are vulnerable to the supply on that. You bring up another uh, idea in my mind, and that is I recently heard a national report about Russia and the economy is so bad that people are not being paid in the military. Uh, very uh, of much concern was the fact that the employees at the nuclear power plants were not being paid, and what if they go out and refuse to work? Uh, and some of the systems, the nuclear power plants are so old they need to have replacement, they could have a meltdown, even in Moscow itself. Uh, that would be uh, disastrous for uh, the people and even the world. Is there a similar problem in Ukraine about, you're talking about all this technology, and I assume they use this technology as part of their trading with Russia to get what they need, vice versa. That's true. It, the, problem, the problem is very similar. The, uh, the employees are not paid in Russia for the same reason. They probably don't get paid regularly in Ukraine, and that's because the, both of those countries rely upon businesses for their, almost their total source of revenue. The business taxes are immense. They're unbelievable. I call them mindless. They didn't understand what they were doing when they legislated those taxes. They're so severe that companies simply don't pay them. And the countries do not have a way to enforce their tax laws and, for, and enforce the collections. So monies are not paid into the treasury in Moscow, so the school teachers don't get paid. The Soviet army doesn't get paid. The miners don't get paid, and fairly soon they're into stagnation, totally. Similar conditions exist in the Ukraine. Their taxation policy is probably the most serious thing they have to deal with. They, they just believe industry is an endless source of money. Frank, I commend you so much for taking all this time and energy that you're doing to try to assist. You know, and This whole process that you and others are doing could be very, very crucial to the introduction to Marx and maybe preventing another arms race if, if the system doesn't work and collapses. But I guess that's my next question is, how much time are they going to have to correct some of those problems in the tax law and the whole structure? Otherwise, is there a danger that out of this frustration of economic depression that this experiment will not succeed and we'll back into a uh, dictatorial setting? I don't know what the chance of that would be. I personally believe that it's, that it's very remote, that it'll ever go back to what it was before. But I also believe it's going to be a long time before it gets significantly better. It can become better gradually. They simply have to learn that successes are not going to come in big steps. They're going to come in small steps. And incrementally, they will get better. And since they already had a very difficult life in the past, we may be assuming that uh, they have less patience than they actually have as they're trying to work through this economic difficulty. Well, they're in a, they're in many families, they're in a position of survival and what we worry about. And I think one of the reasons the U.S. finances a lot of these programs is that we don't want them to make serious mistakes. And I know in Ukraine where I'm going to go, they have huge amounts of radioactive materials. And the scientists or workers that are there where that material is stored, um, certain has temptations to sell it to people we wouldn't want it sold to. So we, the United States, are trying to do what we can to make their economy become energized as rapidly as possible so we don't have to worry about 
that problem anymore. It's a beautiful uh, example of why we cannot have isolation. That if that, those nuclear materials got in the hands of certain countries, it could be very dangerous for our own security. It'd be terrible. Nothing that you've talked about with us before, but we own the air, and also I've talked to you in, in other settings. They're also very concerned about big monopolies. Uh, what uh, is that all about? Well, as the government officials think ahead to having an active role in, in business development, they have a concern that what they might create is a, a monopolistic situation, that someone will control all the transportation, and someone will control all of the uh, uh, automobile manufacturing, and they don't want that to happen. Uh, at this time, I would also suggest that another concern that, that's, <coughs> that's been dealt with uh, on your other trips, and that is the whole issue of crime and uh, both inside government and the general population that is, as they're going through this whole process, uh, is there more or less crime than they had in the past? Oh, I think it's more. You know, I've heard about the mafia and, and the lawlessness that it occurs in some high official levels. What really surprised me and really was disappointing was the concern that families have for being robbed. and. Um, Every apartment that we visited in Russia has outside of the door to the, to the apartment itself is a steel casing and in, hung in there is a steel door. And you have to unlock this steel door before you can get to your apartment door. And that steel casement is put in there so it is burglar proof. And if they don't do this, people come in and steal their electric stove or their stereo or a television set. And it just must be awful to have to live under those conditions day in, year in, year out. Just awful. So are they more concerned about, and, and I guess that it has a relationship with the economy, they're more concerned about being robbed that way than they are uh, violence against the persons in, like in the area of murder? And I think so. I think, um, yes, oh, I'm certain that's true. Now the violence, the, that level of lawlessness uh, happens at the business level. Um, and the people that have the most dangerous jobs these days seems to be the bankers. If they make a loan or if they don't make a loan, they seem to be vulnerable to retribution by somebody who disagreed with, with whatever action they took. Bankers are really a difficult profession to follow over there. But there are, uh, there are gangs, there are organizations, and I guess they're called the mafia, that extort ransom or uh, money from businesses just for the privilege of doing business. They sell permits. They sell insurance so your building doesn't get painted with graffiti. And that lawlessness will continue for a while until it evolves and things get better. How about the government officials themselves? Are they subject to bribes as they've had experience under the old system that that was the case? Well, I hear that that's true. I personally don't know that government officials, I personally don't personally have an experience to it. But I will tell you of a personal experience in which I did bribe somebody. I was leaving the airport, and, uh, and they have a terrible scam there. They charge you extra money for your baggage. If it weighs a lot, they charge you a lot. And I was leaving this airport one time. Uh, I left it, and I had to pay $78 cash money, American, and I, or I wouldn't leave. And this was the next trip, and I was there again at the same checkout place, and this was a woman there. And she was shaking her head at how much baggage I had or how heavy it was. And so I had a 50,000 ruble note, which was about $20. And I just set it on her desk and I just said, well, I'm going to go talk to some of my friends. And I didn't have to pay any excess baggage. It was all taken care of. I bribed her. And I thought, this must go on all day. Janelle Burke. <laughs> One of the concerns that we will have, of course, is for people who are growing older in these countries. What happens to the older person yes. when they're no longer able to work? Uh, break your heart. We, every day, when we travel to um, wherever the office that we're going to, we see old people in the 70s. They look feeble, but they're with these brooms that have been made out of bunches of twigs and branches. They're sweeping the street or they're picking up papers or shoveling snow. And these people should be at home where it's warm. It's terrible. And, you know, their pensions now, because of inflation, have so little buying power, they have to do whatever they can do to make money. The next question I have to, has to do with our language. 
and you have traveled all over Eastern Europe, basically, and uh, uh, over a lot of the world. Um, did you find that as an English-speaking person you were able to travel in these countries, uh, in the Eastern European countries in particular, and what language did you use? I, you, I can only use English as my only language, and I'm embarrassed to say that. But yes, I got along better than I thought I would. Uh, people everywhere are anxious to help. And in the Eastern Europe, a majority of students studied English when they were in school. And while they may not be able to speak it, they can understand much of what you say. So if you're asking directions, or if you're ordering something from a menu in a restaurant, they will be able to help you. So what you're saying is that in other countries, they, they do study multiple languages. Oh, yes, they do. And from a young age, we even at kindergarten level, as we've visited schools, had kindergarten kids speaking to us in English and speaking very well. I, I want to just follow up on that concerning children. And I, in my trips to Europe, <clears throat> I was very interested in how the educational system is very different from this country and, and the time and that's put in each year and, uh, and what they do. How about in Russia and Ukraine and other places you've been? What observations do you have other than what you've talked about concerning languages about their curriculum and what they're trying to teach the children for the future? I believe there's a, uh, an accurate consciousness by the educators over there that their students will have to be qualified to work in the international era. Uh, and so they welcome the opportunity for their students to visit with people that speak English. They are, um, I think, making an emphasis in Russia, we saw this, on having them learn to speak Mandarin Chinese. So they're teaching them how to broaden their scope. And I was able to give some lectures uh, in Siberia to a group of economic students at a university level who were uh, studying economics uh, on an international basis. They're also teaching, uh, I would assume, to understand technology such as computers and so forth. Is that? Yes, they teach it. They're, they're, uh, they have a handicap that their classrooms are usually short of the equipment that they need, but they do have enough equipment there so that people learn it. On that note, on behalf of Janelle Burke and our staff, I have to say that we're out of time, and Frank Henderson, it's been so informative to have you here, and we thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Frank Henderson, a volunteer executive with the International Executive Service Corps. We've very much enjoyed bringing you this program. We invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when we will discuss yet, discuss yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.